Beta blockers are one of the most common classes of drugs mentioned in medicine. As the name suggests, their mechanism of action is by blocking or antagonizing the beta adrenergic receptors in the body. So let's quickly recap what the different adrenergic receptors are responsible for. An adrenergic receptor itself is a receptor that is bound by catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. We have alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, 2 and even beta-3 adrenergic receptors that are usually G-protein coupled receptors that ultimately lead to an increase in cyclic AMP leading to downstream effects. Alpha-1 receptors are present in the vascular beds, both arterial and venous beds, and activation of these receptors leads to vasoconstriction, meaning that we have an increase in the mean arterial pressure and also increased venous return. Other effects include medriasis, meaning pupil dilation, remember D for dilation, as well as contraction of the urethral sphincter and the prostate. Alpha-2 receptors are receptors that decrease the sympathetic tone in various tissues. These tissues include the pancreatic islet cells and adipose cells, where they decrease insulin release and decrease lipolysis, respectively. They also cause less aqueous humour to be produced from the ciliary body of the eye. Beta-1 receptors are found on the cardiac myocytes, as well as on the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes. Their activation leads to an increase in contractility, termed a positive ionotropic effect, and also an increase in the conduction through the SA and the AV nodes, termed a positive chronotropic effect. These receptors are also actually present in the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which, when activated, lead to an increase in the production of renin. For beta-2, the receptors ultimately lead to smooth muscle relaxation. Therefore, we have bronchodilation and vasodilation because these receptors are present in the airways and in the vessels. Interestingly, they are also present in the uterus, and so by causing smooth muscle relaxation, they actually prevent premature labour. Beta-2 receptors are also present in other tissues, such as in adipose cells, pancreatic islet cells, and the ciliary body. However, compared to alpha-2 receptors, the effects are basically the opposite. For example, we have an increase in lipolysis, an increase in insulin release, and an increase in aqueous humor production. Now, for the classification, beta blockers are divided into several different classes based on which receptors they block. Non-selective beta blockers don't discriminate between beta-1 or beta-2 receptors, and examples of which include propanolol and timolol. Beta-1 selective, as you can imagine, only block the beta-1 receptors, and these include metropolol, bisoprolol, and atenolol. Thirdly, we have beta blockers that also have some alpha blocking properties, such as labetalol. Finally, some beta blockers have some intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, meaning they can also even act as agonists on the beta receptors, as well as acting as antagonists. This is in a competitive way. Examples include acebutalol and pindolol. Now let's look at when you would give them and the uses of beta blockers. First off, we have the decrease in myocardial contractility and a decrease in the heart rate meaning they decrease the oxygen consumption from the contractility and, due to the slower heart rate, we have a longer perfusion time during diastole. Therefore, this is why we use beta-1 selective agents in chronic heart failure, unstable angina, acute coronary syndromes and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Secondly, beta blockers are also often used as antihypertensive medications, but they are not usually the first line. The first line is usually ACE inhibitors, diuretics, or calcium channel blockers. Beta blockers are often used when the patients have hypertension alongside something else, such as chronic heart failure patients that are hypertensive. So how do they drop the blood pressure? So we know blood pressure is given by the cardiac output multiplied by the systemic vascular resistance, and the cardiac output itself is given by the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. We know that the drop comes from the decreased cardiac output coming from a decreased heart rate and the lower contractility. 
And so if we use a beta blocker with some alpha antagonizing properties like labetalol, we also see a drop in the systemic vascular resistance due to the vasodilation. And that also contributes to the decrease in blood pressure. Labetalol itself is often used in hypertensive emergencies due to the fact that it acts quickly and is safe to use in pregnancy. We then have things like migraine prophylaxis. Examples of beta blockers used as migraine prophylaxis include metropolol or timolol. The catecholamine crisis that is seen in a thyroid storm may also be treated by beta blockers. Specifically, propanolol is used alongside prednisone and propiothiouracil, and this combination of therapy is known as the three Ps. Then, beta blockers can be used as a treatment for essential tremors, and finally, they can be used as antiarrhythmic agents. Specifically, they are class 2 antiarrhythmics, which are often used post myocardial infarction where there is a high risk of an arrhythmia. Now let's take a look at some of the side effects of beta blockers. First of all, due to the negative chronotropic effect, we can of course get bradycardia and even heart block. This is why they are often contraindicated in people with heart block. Secondly, due to the decrease in contractility, as well as the decrease in heart rate, they can actually cause the cardiac output to drop so much that circulation backs up into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema. For this reason, beta blockers need to be used slowly and carefully, and it's also why it's so crucial to look for signs of pulmonary edema in these patients. Next, we have the effect of blocking the beta-2 receptors in the airways. We know that activation of these receptors normally gives us bronchodilation, but if we block them, we end up with bronchoconstriction. And therefore, we can end up exacerbating the symptoms of asthma or COPD. So often, in patients with asthma or COPD, it's better to give the cardioselective beta blockers. Erectile dysfunction is another potential side effect of beta blocker therapy. Finally, we have the treatment for when beta blockers are not appropriate and we end up with a patient who has beta blocker toxicity. The antidote is glucagon because it has been shown to improve nodal conduction and therefore increases the heart rate as well as increasing myocardial contractility.